Web Systems Week 7, Computer Science 1. Today we're going to talk about computer science theory. In particular, we're going to talk about computing. For the next couple of lectures, Week 7 and Week 8, we're going to cover some generic computer science theory. And the reason why is that as an IT professional and a computer scientist, you need to learn some computer science theory. We've already looked at file systems. We've already looked at some complexity theory. Remember order in. And today we're going to look at information and a little bit about computation. So just in this lecture, we're going to talk about the storage and processing of information on a computer. And we can't talk about computers without we can't really look at computing without looking a little bit about the history of computing. Now when I talk about computing, I don't mean modern day computing, I mean actual computing. One of the earliest computers that was designed was called the Analytic Engine by a guy called Charles Babbage. In some ways you could say this was a steampunk computer, strictly using mechanical and hydraulic devices to do calculations. He never actually built it, simply because he didn't have the technology or the funding to do it. So a mathematician called Louis Menabre, he extended the design. And what happened is, Lady Ada Lovelace, who's the daughter of Lord Byron the poet, actually used Menabre's paper to help secure funding and construction of the analytic engine, and actually worked. So a computer has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, Shelley Cashman believes it's simply an electronic machine. They can get some instructions, put it in memory somewhere, accept data, manipulate the data, and produce results, and then store the results. Simple process. It might seem quite simple to any, But unfortunately, nobody actually could get a really scalable working computer until the late 1940s, when John von Neumann, just after World War II, developed an architecture he called the von Neumann architecture. And it's quite simple. You have a, a processor, memory, and a bit of input-output. It seems fairly obvious nowadays, but it wasn't obvious in those days. And of course, you know what the computer is. It's hardware, it's a CPU memory, a bit of input-output, a bit of storage. We know this already from previous lectures. But what's memory? It's um, basically a place that you can store programs and you can store data. And typically in modern binary computers, it's stored as binary, that's either on or off. Different types of memory, of course, is a thing called ROM or read-only memory. Um, an extension of that could be flash in some ways. When you have flash biases, a thing is called EEPROMs, which are reprogrammable read-only memory. And RAM is what we mostly see in a computer. So when we talk about eight gigabytes of memory in a computer, we're talking about RAM. Typically your ROM won't be only, I don't know, 128 megabytes or something like that. That's used up. You typically it's used when you boot up a computer. Some people like to call this firmware. So a few terms used around. I.O. devices are fairly obvious, input, output, and network and storage devices. I won't really delve with that. And the CPU itself. Now, a CPU, or central processing unit, typically is something like an Intel machine, or an Intel architecture, or an ARM architecture. And there's a few others around as well, like MIPS, for example. Um, you might have heard of, of um, AMD, but that's actually Intel. There are different architectures out there. But they all look the same. Typically, you have a thing called a control unit. You have an arithmetic unit a memory controller of some kind, and typically bits of internal memory called registers. These internal memory is tightly tied to the control unit. So let's take a look at these components. First component is the thing that actually does the calculations, the arithmetic unit, or arithmetic logic unit. It does arithmetic and logical operations, plus, minus, multiplication, division, uh, logic like AND or NOT. Um, there's a control unit that controls the flow of information inside the CPU. It uh, sets up the arithmetic logic with instructions. And um, 
it basically controls the flow of the instructions to memory to the arithmetic unit, both ways. And uh, I mentioned a thing called registers. They're just typically extremely fast memory. They're typically used in the instructions that are used to control the arithmetic. And the process is really simple. All it does is a very, very basic, simple cycle. A lot more complicated than this, of course, in real life. But essentially what it does is what we call a fetch-execute cycle. Now we do is we fetch some information, fetch some information, we decode it, so convert it from what's raw data into some executable commands. We then read memory when appropriate. It's not always there, just be careful of like that. Sometimes it's not needed, not always needed. And then you execute the instruction. So it does various things. And once you execute the instruction, you simply go to the next cycle, which is fetch the next instruction and continue on. So we fetch, decode, read memory if necessary, execute, and we keep going in the circle forever until the machine is physically turned off. So all CPUs do these types of cycles, but just be aware, I mentioned it was a simplification there are a lot more improvements out there. For example, a concept called hyperthreading, where you execute more than one instruction at the same time, but basically queued up very fast. You might have multiple CPUs, for example, or what we call multiple cores in some cases, like an i5 or an i7 processor from Intel. But this is just the basic concept. Now these instructions tell the computer what to do, and depending on the architecture instruction, they load data and continue on forever. So, one thing I'd like you to try to look up if you have a chance to, look at Wikipedia, look up von Neumann, and see if there's other computing architectures out there. I'll give you a big hint, modified Harvard architectures, quantum computing is out there as well. This is non, there's a, uh, you can almost say there's biological computing architectures out there, using DNA for example. Good thing to look at.